In this video, we're going to take a look at ethics in computer science, mainly looking at copyright and plagiarism. So what are ethics? Ethics is a set of principles or morals that a person or it could be a business follows. So it's your sort of moral code, like what do you think is right and wrong? Now when discussing computers, we focus on three sort of main areas, intellectual property, privacy issues, and the effect of computers on society. So taking a look at these in a little bit more detail. So intellectual property rights covers copying anybody's work in whole or in part, including a program, it could be an image someone's made, it could be some music someone's made, and this is usually a violation of copyright law. Privacy issues cover things like hacking, illegal access to personal data, uh, how data is stored and used, and then the effects on computers on society, such as things as the environment, so like recycling and using the precious metals in computers, people losing jobs to robots and computer-based uh, labor methods, and social impacts. So let's start off with copyright and plagiarism because they're both very similar. So plagiarism is the idea of you taking the work of another person and then passing it off as your own. So if you take a paragraph of a website and then include it in your work without a reference, then you've plagiarized. Copyright is a legal system that is to protect an author's right to distribute work as they see fit. So that can be me creating a video, could be me making, say if I wrote a song and recorded it, I have the right to say who can send that, who gets money from that. I could say, right, I'm waiving my rights and you can do what you want with it. Or I could say, actually, I want to sell it on a record label and get the profits. Even you giving a friend a copy of a film or an MP3 that you've legally downloaded, technically breaches copyright because they should be buying it from the author, not getting it for free off you. Now, the risk of plagiarism is that you're also breaking copyright law most of the time. But if you're not breaking copyright law, then it looked bad. Which sounds daft, people might not care, but if you're known to be uh, like copying off people all the time, then you're not going to be as reliable as a source. If you do this in university, you can get expelled for plagiarism, you can get in a lot of trouble even at GCSE level. So a few examples is quite a few students in the UK have been, and teachers for that matter, have been accused of plagiarism when submitting their coursework. Now, the first main section of coursework for our Creative Eye Media course is discussing and writing about certain topics. Now, because of the internet, it's very easy just to Google a question you've got and find the first thing you find is a correct answer and copy it. Because if you think about it, why would you write something that's already been written? But that's not you doing the work. So what you need to do is look at a couple of sites, look at the sources, come together with your own conclusion, write your own paragraph on that, and then reference the sites you've used. So here's an example of how you should be referencing work. Okay, so let's say that you are writing an essay on toasters. So let's say an essay about toasters. So I'm starting my essay for whatever course it is I've got to do. So first things first, I might say, right, when were toasters inventors? I'd say, right. Um, did you know that the toaster was invented? And you go, right, actually, when was it invented? I'm not sure. So you go onto the internet and you Google it and you go, when was the toaster invented? And it says, right, 1983. So you go, all right, 1983 by Alan McCaster in Scotland. And then you carry on talking about your essay. Now, what I've done there is I've plagiarised, this because it's not my research, I didn't look at that, it's a website. Now, you can use it, that's absolutely fine. But the safest way, especially at a sort of GCSE A-level level, is you need to reference that. So if you go to references and you go to insert footnote, you find the website, which isn't just Google search, client, opera, whatever it is. This is the website, so you click on the website, you click that, copy and paste the link, paste that in there, and then you say, when did you last access it? So, last accessed, so in my case, it will be 27th of March, 2020. Done. So I've said that I've got that information, 
from thoughtco.com and when I accessed it. I can then carry on and put some facts. So you can also do things like exact quotes, which I would still do the same thing. So what I might say is, um, I copy that completely and say, a fun fact about toasters is, now I'm gonna put that in speech marks because that's an exact quote, which again, I should be inserting a footnote, getting my link, putting that in there, last accessed 27th of the 3rd, 2020. Now this isn't Harvard reference or anything like that, it's just a basic reference, but if I was marking this work, I can see right, this is an exact quote. So I'm not gonna penalize them for copying that because they have taken it from a website and they've sourced where that's from. But then what the author should be doing then is then expanding upon that, putting their own opinion and talking about that some more. So um, adding a little bit more information from their own brain, their own thoughts. That means then that they've taken a source, they've sourced it, they've read it, and they've shown they've understood it. That's the kind of thing you should be doing when you are writing things and trying not to plagiarize. So you should be using footnotes to reference everything you've used the internet for. If you're writing something like, oh, well, I, I personally have five toasts in my house. That doesn't need a reference because that's from you. You don't have to do anything like that. That's absolutely fine. But it's really important that you are sourcing where you get your information from. So it's really important that we're doing that because if you're not doing that in your work, then we use, especially with the computers nowadays, there's a lot of online ones, a special software we can use that checks for plagiarism. I remember when I was at university, I wrote a website for one of my assignments and then I helped my friend by giving my codes and I use this to help you and improve your website. So I did. And then they ended up getting actually, I didn't get caught for plagiarism and I shouldn't have done it in the first place, that's me in the wrong. But they actually got a higher grade than me because their write-up must have been better. But the actual hard part, making the website, was my work and they got a better grade than me. So I was really annoyed about that. So giving people your work is plagiarism, they're plagiarised from you. You'll get in trouble, they'll get in trouble. If you plagiarise a website or a book or anything like that, you should be referencing. Otherwise, you will get some form of punishment. It could be you get a reduced grade, it could be that you get no grade, it could be that you get kicked out. So it's really important that we're following them. Now copyright is a little bit difficult to discuss as each country has different rules. Now in the EU, we've got GDPR. In England, used to be the Data Protection Act, and I presume that uh, as Brexit goes along, that will switch and we'll have our own version of GDPR slash data protection. And then some countries have a very few copyright laws and some have lots. So I'm not just talking about computers. If you go to certain countries, like for example, Turkey, they have lots of genuine fakes are called. So you can get some, you know, uh, North Face jackets and things like that, that look real because the copyright laws, even though they're there, they're not as actively enforced. So quite often people go there and get fake stuff, bring it back because it's cheaper and nothing really happens. Whereas if I decide to go do that in England and set up loads of fakes about a market, I could quite easily get taken to court. So all work, Technically, if you create something, it's copyrighted, but then you need to actually be able to prove it if you want to actually, say I made a, made a program and then put it on GitHub or whatever, or put it on the internet and said, oh look at this program I've made and someone copied it. I could then say, right, I'm taking it to court, I want some money because you're making money off my idea, but then I've actually got to prove it. So that's why most companies apply for official recognition. So then they've got that proof, they can say, right, on this date, we pay for copyright, We've got the you know, copyright symbol, it's all sorted, we're ready. And they can prove that then in court. Whereas if you say, oh, that was my idea, they'll go, we'll prove it. However, this changes when we use online services. So Facebook, any picture you upload to Facebook belongs to Facebook, not you. So when you scroll through those terms and conditions that you don't read, you actually say everything you post belongs to them. So they can use your face on their adverts and things if they want. Now, one thing that circulates every so often uh, especially with the older audiences on Facebook, is people saying, right, a Facebook status saying, I do not give Facebook the right to use my images and this is my personal property and I am invoke invoking my rights. Yeah, that's a lot of rubbish. It's just what someone's done, usually, to get recognition on their Facebook page. 
So you've waived all those rights. Your pictures belong to Facebook. Some people care. I mean, I don't really care. I've got nothing on there that I wouldn't want on the internet. But, you know, something to be thoughtful about. Now, think about the cost of copyright. Films, music, games cost millions of pounds to develop. Now, apparently, the amount of people that break the law and download copyrighted music costs the industry 8.5 billion pounds a year and then loses a further 1.5 billion for the tax man. So the tax that's not getting paid. So if we manage to cut that piracy rate from 25% to 15% would mean there's 40,000 extra jobs in the ICT sector and then the government would get an extra 2.5 billion, which you might think, well, I don't care about the government, but if the government's getting more money, that's more money for public services and things. But obviously then there is the whole fact with the internet, it's so easy to get pirated software that a lot of people see, what's the point? What's the point of me going to a shop and paying 80 pound for a piece of software when I could just download it illegally for free? And that's the thing, the main thing that people are trying to battle. Now, there are risks of copyrighted software. So if you download a piece of software for torrenting site, you could get a virus or spyware. Now this happened a lot when I was at school, there was a program called LimeWire that everybody at school who had had the internet would download songs and like give them to people at school and share them on your phones and things like that. Don't forget this was like 2003 when I was in secondary school. So the main risk was on this website, on this program, sorry, LimeWire, was that people were downloading songs and there's quite often like clickbaity style, like links that said, right, um, it might be say an album's coming out and it'll say, right, early release of so-and-so's album. So you'll go, oh, brilliant. You're, you know, you're 11 year old, 12 year old boy, you click it, brilliant. And then it should be a virus or spyware. So there's a massive risk, especially with certain websites for software that's uploaded that's got viruses or spyware. Now there's also no warranty or support. If you download, say, Dreamweaver illegally, if you've got a problem it won't install, you can't start sending things like error codes to Dreamweaver, you can't start access there talking to them because they'll look up and say, all right, what's your email address? You give me your email address and they go, well, you're not registered. So then they'll know exactly who you are and probably send you a um, a court summons or a fine or something or make you buy the software. Now, some of these pieces of software might miss important key functions. So it might not be able to do certain things because it's cracked and they can't risk you getting caught. So they might have to take things out completely. And then you could end up in court with a large fine and possible prison sentence. Now it's more likely you'll get the fine than prison sentence, but if you're a person who is actually hacking and creating these hacks and cracking all this software, then you are likely to get a prison sentence. If you are just downloading and consuming, you're more likely just to get the fine. Now, Tom Scott, is a he's got lots of uh, subscribers on YouTube, but he's got millions and he's a very, very clever man, and he's got a really interesting video on copyright. Uh, so if you search for Tom Scott copyright, he's got a 49 minute video on copyright and how that sort of goes into the role with YouTube and the present day with all the gaming footage and things being put online. So it's really interesting. I'm not gonna talk about it because he knows a lot more than me and he's got a whole video on it, but that is something that you may want to watch if you wanna know a bit more about copyright. Right, hopefully copyright and plagiarism is now nice and clear for you. And I will see you in the next video. Don't forget to subscribe and like, and I will see you then.